Hello, everyone. So apparently Wicked Supreme has written up some thoughts on our last two debates. I was pleasantly surprised to see that these were in fact genuine reflections, minus some deflections regarding his own role in guaranteeing that our exchanges were too hostile and suspicious to be productive, and so I will try to respond as if our previous interactions did not already color my impressions of his character and my own conduct during those debates, after a brief consideration of precisely why these interactions did so. I'm not going to recapitulate the sequence of exchanges that led to our two interactions, because that would defeat my purpose for writing this response. I will just say that if at any point he imagined himself to be courting something that could ever approximate to a good-faith conversation when he thirstily tried to depict me as dishonest and cowardly in public prior to and in between each of our two exchanges, he was under a very deep misperception. Had he approached me in good faith, by which I mean, had he been willing to negotiate terms without using external social pressure to strong-arm me into an exchange, where external circumstances hindered my ability to present my own side effectively, I repeatedly stated, for example, that I was unwell for reasons that my audience by now is well aware of, and had he treated our exchanges while they were occurring as conversations rather than domination routines for the benefit of an incurious audience, once again at multiple points he interjects to say, I sound as if I'm about to cry, and to ask, are you okay? You sound like you're going to piss yourself. Are you okay? We might have had a very productive, perhaps even pleasant back and forth. Instead, we had to play a game of trying to maneuver each other to make the other look bad for an audience. All this to say, again, if a good faith interrogation of the issues was what Wicked Supreme really wanted, he did everything in his power to make that impossible. There is a bad habit many fall into where, when presented with a binary, they reflexively and uncritically accept the binary as true and locate all meaningful nuance to litigations between them. For example, a child is told that communism is the opposite of capitalism, that communists believe in collective ownership while capitalists believe in owning what you produce and buy for yourself, and therefore grows up to believe simplistically that the real stakes involved in debates between critics and advocates for capitalism are whether everybody gets to own their own toys or not. Alternatively, one asks whether one has the right to use lethal force to defend one's property in a conversation about whether or not a particular act has moral sanctions such that defending it doesn't bear additional implications for one's normative loyalties. This might seem like a straightforward question if one assumes that all these things are simply and obviously understood in a common way by each party. But if they are not, however, then it may be the case that by answering with a simple yes or no, even though this might progress the conversation forward more fluidly, it might also have the effect of burying a particularity in one's own meaning that bears serious implications for the significance of the answer. Are we saying that one has a right to defend one's property in the context of the law of a specific state? That it is absolutely a given that in any case where one believes that one's possessions are threatened, that one is thereby licensed to deploy lethal force, for that matter, what does it mean for something to be one's property? If property is not understood in a way that makes the analogy or the statement commensurate with the event one is attempting to litigate about, permitting the meaning of these terms to go uninterrogated buries one's actual position in favor of the one held by the one who asked the question and who incidentally stacked the decks by loading it in his terms as if these were unproblematic. Similarly, in his reflections, Wicked Supreme floats two explanations for why he thinks communication failed between us. The first is that I was simply avoiding engagement with him by being a pedantic snob. The second is that I've lost the ability to translate my thoughts into terms understandable to a lay audience because my nose has been in the books for too long. He does not consider the possibility that the appearance of one and two are the result of the manner in which these interactions took place. By invidiously insinuating that my attempts to problemize terms relevant to the discussion was me being Weasley, and that my preference to set the conversation at a slightly later date for purposes of preparation demonstrated that I was attempting to flee the exchange, Wicked Supreme made it so that I could not engage with him in a conversation. To attempt such would be naive. Had I persisted in treating our interactions as good-faith conversations when nothing about their framing or their manner would suggest that they were, in fact, quite the opposite, I'd still have failed to have a conversation, which is nonetheless what I was still attempting to do when I was attempting to give reasons for why I can't just naively accept the terms of Wicked Supreme's hypotheticals, as well as have been knocked about rhetorically by the little acts of performative condescension that passes for rhetoric in these online circles. The mistake on my part, the main mistake that is, 
was acknowledging the initial taunts that instigated the exchanges that led to these debates in the first place. There was no practical purpose and there could be no hope of a productive interaction given these conditions. That being said, despite Wicked Supreme's evading responsibility for his own behavior during and outside of our debates in his reflections, I respect very much the attempt to seriously grapple with the radical difference in approach to these topics that he was presented with during them, and his acknowledgement that he has work to do to improve his abilities in this area. I also recognize that there is a deceptively steep learning curve and a lot to unpack involved in educating oneself to the point that one is able to navigate these questions lucidly, and that time is precious. So to the end of collaborating and assisting each other in increasing our mutual understanding, assuming that that's what we both truly want to do, I have the following suggestions for Wicked Supreme and anyone else interested in exploring these topics more critically to look into the following sources which I have selected for their brevity, clarity, and scope. Reading these carefully, it shouldn't take more than a few months at most, will provide a major advantage in critically addressing the issues we touched on during our debate. First, Indian Migration and Empire by Radhika Mangia. Read this for an unpacking of methodological assumptions about the need for borders as population filters, for the emergence of nation-states and liberal conceptions of property and subjectivity, as well as a critical and extremely in-depth account of the emergence of the modern system of states. Next, Walled States Waning Sovereignty by Wendy Brown. Read this for an overview on the development of historical conceptions of sovereignty and the right to determine when the normal state of things has been upset so that the law may be broken to preserve it. Next, Seeing Like a State by James C. Scott. Read this for an account of how the bureaucratic scientific structure of the modern state systematically homogenizes the things within its domain to produce a simulated world that, while functionally legible enough for its purposes, severely restricts our ability as thinking human beings to conceptualize things in ways that are more accurate and particular, if less conveniently for state administration. In addition to these, the following are highly recommended as essential background reading on the development of liberal political philosophy. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes, The Second Treatise on Government and the Letter Concerning Toleration by John Locke, The Discourse on the Arts and Sciences and the Discourse Concerning Inequality by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Science as a Vocation and Politics as a Vocation by Max Weber, and The Concept of the Political by Carl Schmitt. As always, thank you for listening, and take care.